So hi guys, we'll just start with our introductions. You probably already know us, but I'm Sriya and I just got done with 12th grade. I got into universities in US, UK, Singapore, Bahrain, and now I'll be studying in India after writing my medical entrance exam, and Ananya. Hi everyone, I'm Ananya. I got into universities in US and Canada. I'm currently a first year at uh, UC Berkeley and I'm majoring in psychology and English. Yeah, so let's um, get started. Okay. Are you going to screen share? Yeah. Okay. Let's start with uh, US and Canada first. So, just a second. Yeah. So, uh, when you're thinking of applying to any university anywhere, you should keep certain goals and objectives in mind. Uh, one of these is uh, academic goals. So what kind of a course you want? Because courses vary in different countries and in different universities. So you should, you should be aware of what you want from your course. If you have any research interests, then you should have uh, at least a blurry idea of what you want to research in so that you can choose your uh, university according to that. You should have the career goals in mind. It's, it's not necessary for, for you to figure out what you really want to do after you graduate, but even a starting idea, if you're, say, um, if you're going into psychology, because I, I had, I experienced this, so if you are going into psychology, even a starting idea that I want to be a psychologist is fine, because psychology is a very broad field, so you can go into different career paths from there. That's true for any other major as well. Even if it's bio, you can go into research, you can go into medical, depending upon how your goals change. According to that, you should have the best options out there. So you should have the best kind of internships available to you. You have to research into all of these things because different universities give different opportunities. You should check into uh, graduation rate of each university, postgrad placements where, where people go for um, postgrad studies, like say from one university, people get into uh, Harvard or Stanford for postgrad. Grad. That's a pretty good sign. Just a second. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. People are still coming in. Okay. All right. Yeah. Those who just came in, we just started and we're talking about a uh, starting point in this college application journey. You should um, have your mind. Can you please mute your mic if you're on unmute? Um, so you should have your goals defined in the start. Um, uh, don't go through this journey without any kind of clarity because it becomes all the more stressful. Even if it's a blurry kind of goal, it's fine. So like I said, academic goals, you should know what, what you want from your course because different universities offer different courses, different universities focus on different research. So if you're, if you're going for research, then you should have this particular field in mind where you want to research. So say in biology, if you want to uh, research in genetics so you should have this in mind that i want to research in genetics and uh, res uh research universities what kind of research they're doing you should have your career goals in mind what kind of options you want in your internships uh where do people in different universities end up so say in some university people might end up in harvard for say law, law after uh graduating and uh how many people graduate, certain uni universities could have very low graduation rates. That's a red flag. So you should check into all of that. Um, and also you should have your personal development goals. So uh, especially in US, there's this thing that certain universities are better suited for a certain kind of person. So if you're like a very independent person uh, who can navigate your way around any kind of situation, you will be better suited uh, 
with the university rather than if you are some kind of person who needs a little bit of guidance. Uh, so in that case, another university will be better suited for you. So this is something you should always have in mind uh, before starting this process. Even if you're going through this process right now and you're really confused, you have to just sit down and list out these certain goals, my academic goals, my career goals, my personal development goals. Um, so now, uh, after you've written your goals, you should align these with your objectives. So say for your academic goals, you had a particular course structure in mind. So um, you should judge your academic programs accordingly. I'm going to show you how to do college research. A lot of people don't know how to go about this. I'm going to walk you step by step through this the way I did it. So um, academic programs vary from universities. I'm going to show how, how that's possible. Um, certain universities are very big. So the university I'm going to, it has like 40,000 students and certain classes go up to a thousand students. So you have to be proactive in that case. You won't have a teacher who will check on you. You have to go to the teacher as opposed to a private university, which will have less number of students. So better student faculty ratio, if that's your environment, that's completely fine too. Um, maybe you need more personal attention. You need more connection with your professors. A private environment is better for that. Um, you also should keep in mind the location um, because uh, this is something people tend to ignore while doing the college research, but uh, location matters a lot. So say weather, if you're going from Bahrain, you don't want to end up in a chilly place, which you can't handle, especially if you're the kind of person who can't even handle winters in say Bahrain or in India. So you're better off going to a place like California or Texas where things are relatively less chilly. Uh, you should check the safety of that location. So um, certain places are more safer than others. This is especially true when you compare suburb, suburbs and cities. So cities tend to be a little less safe compared to suburbs. Uh, and proximity to cities, of course. If you're within a city, that's well and good. Proximity to cities becomes important when you need opportunities in terms of internships, because a lot of this network is concentrated within cities. And another thing to keep in mind is advising and support networks within and outside the university. What I mean by this is you're, if you're going abroad, you're traveling halfway across the world. If something ever happens to you and God forbid something happens to you, your parents will take a lot of time to fly to that place. So you need an immediate family member, even if it's extended family, at least four hours away. One thing that a lot of people face when they go abroad is they get really homesick and things start to get downhill, go downhill for, from there. So having a relative nearby is very helpful because you can go there for, week, for weekends and you can stay at their place and feel a little at home. Because the culture shock is re real, you will, in the start, you will feel like you don't fit in, which is completely okay. Everyone goes through that, but uh, you should have someone to rely on. And, in that, and that's true within the university as well. It's better if you know a senior within the university who can help you navigate through the university. I personally, uh, I started college this year and I have a senior, he's from our school within the university and he's been helping me out, which is very, very helpful for me because things start tend to get uh, very overwhelming in college. So having a support system is very, very important, especially having someone nearby. So other things you should check out when you're researching colleges is campus life. So if you're interested in sports, then what kinds of uh, extracurricular opportunities you have events, student organizations, housing, etc. So in certain places, housing is very expensive and it's very it's not worth the money. So that's something you should definitely look into. Um, student organizations, because you're not going to be in class all the time. Actually, you have way more free time in college than you do in school for your own personal interests and uh, activities. So 
having a clear idea of student organizations is very important for me when i was researching colleges two of the things that i really wanted to invest myself in was writing and badminton because i didn't get to do it a lot after a certain point in school so for me uh, and a lot of a lot of uh, universities there don't have badminton as an extracurricular so that when things came down to the last factor badminton was sometimes a deciding factor as well uh, another thing you should look into is peer identities so what i mean by this is diversity so certain universities tend to be more low, uh, tend to have more local population than being well spread out throughout the country or throughout the world while other universities tend to have a lot of international student population as well that's completely up to you if you if you want that reassurance that there will be people out there like you definitely look into diversity uh you have to know the application process different requirements to navigate this and financial aid one of the things that that is the biggest misconception about uh, us and canadian universities is that you don't get a lot of scholarships at undergraduate level which i i personally think is wrong it's a matter of doing your own research and finding opportunities scholarships and stuff rather than simply assuming that they don't offer because they also would like to have people come there like uh, cornell which is one of the ivy leagues has a scholarship particularly designated for indian students it's called a cornell tata scholarship and every year a kid wins that scholarship and goes goes to cornell on a full rights so they don't have to pay anything um so uh just to be sure this is this process is not just about you it's about your parents as well so because your parents are ultimately the ones who are going to invest in this process and what comes after that so your parents play a role but they uh, i would recommend the uh, against them playing the center role you because you have to spend 4 years of your life abroad you are supposed to make your own decision but you are supposed to get support from your parents so some of the uh, roles that parents have is being upfront about limitations personally for me this was like my dad had set the condition that he would not let me go abroad unless i got into a top 30 university within a particular country and because he didn't want to make that kind of investment unless it was really worth it which is which is completely justified if you're going to america you you want to see the statue of liberty not some farm in upstate so you want to go for the best so uh, so just set the ground rules in the start like if i get into this university will my parents allow me what 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 hesitation do they have so that you you guys are on the same page like you don't want to be like yeah i've done all my research and i want to go abroad and they're like i uh, i want to send you abroad right now or they want to send you abroad and you don't you're not mentally prepared to do that that happens as well it has happened to a couple of my friends so be on the same page your parent should be the tool manager not the star so they should give you advice they should not force their decisions on you because again like i said before you're going to spend 4 years over there you don't want to end up in a place where you don't want to be in personally so you should know yourself and you should know where you want to end up in um your parent should also foster resiliency this is a very tough process uh, personally when i went through this i was really burnt out by the end of it i didn't even want to apply after a certain point and my uh, father had to push me to keep applying and consider curves and cliffs manage the hype there's this hype about college being this very free place where you get to do whatever you want which is not true you get you also get bogged down by assignments all the time so just be just keep a complete picture of what a college is in mind and apply accordingly role of the student do the best you can aim for the top like i said you if you're going to say us you want to go for the statue of liberty you don't want to go for a farm be yourself be authentic in your application 
I know uh, I went to several other applications, sample applications while I was applying, and they were so good that I got worried that I wouldn't get into a good university because my resume was not half as good as theirs. And then you kind of want to build up your resume according to this, which is which is the wrong way to go because they want to admit you for you. That, that's one of the things with uh, US and Canadian co colleges. They don't just rely on merit. They also see your personality. So if you're trying to you're pretending to be someone else, they will catch up on it. They will eventually catch up on it. So be true to your interests and your goals and be authentic in your application. Be aware of your social media presence. Uh, this is important. Not do think actually after you apply, uh, admissions officers can always check you up on social media. And also while applying for visas, they do check, they do run a social media check. So you have to be very careful with what you post on social media. And that's like not in the sense that you can't post certain things that are personal to you. It's like don't have very extreme political views that does not reflect well, um, especially uh, relating to other countries because uh, you are an international student, you don't have anything to do with their country. So there's just going to be like, uh, why does it matter what you think? Uh, why are you spreading this information? Be your own best advocate. Um, in the journey, sometimes you're going to have to convince your parents or someone else to uh, come on the same page as you regarding your career decisions or your college decisions where you're applying. You have to do your research and you have to advocate for yourself because uh, you know what's best for yourself. Uh, you have to evaluate things properly and accordingly you have to explain at certain points you're going to have to explain yourself to other people. Cultivate a list of schools, ask advice from others, but remember to take the grain of salt. Uh, so um, it's very easy to like get carried away with rankings and other stuff like I used to go on YouTube and watch day in the life at this college vlogs and it would all just look so perfect um, that I would get obsessed with a certain kind of college which is very wrong because what they show on YouTube is not the actual picture because they want to show all the good stuff right it's YouTube with social media you want to show the good stuff there so when you're taking advice from others they may or may not have extreme views. Someone would be like, oh my God, this college is horrible. Don't go there. And at the same time, another person would be like, oh my God, this college is great. You should totally come here. Don't believe in extreme views. Find a center. So as long as you're finding someone who lists out pros and cons properly for, for you, don't rely on those views. Make, make your own pros and cons and then According to your personality, you should judge whether can I handle these cons? Will these pros work in my favor properly? Or is this just useless? And accordingly, decide your college list. Uh, students take the lead. Do college research on your own. Fill your application. Evaluate pros and cons on your own according to your goals. So um, another thing that happens is, um, uh, especially when you're in 12th, you get really busy with uh, all these exams coming in and, and stuff. So uh, parents tend to do the research, the student sits out, which again is not the way to go because like I said, you, you have to, it's your career. You have to make your own decisions. You have to do your research. You have to decide if a particular college is for you or not. So you have to do your college research on your own. You can't sit out of that part, even if it's boring for you. Uh, it's actually not boring, it's pretty exciting, but uh, you have to visualize what you want from a college and then you have to visualize uh, whichever, your, whichever college you're researching, you have to visualize how you would be in that college and accordingly you have to make a list of pros and cons, cons like I said, and uh, decide if that college should be on your list or not. Uh, again, I'm going to repeat, don't leave your parents to college research. They, if, if it's their first time applying abroad as well, they don't know any better than you. 
so they make a decision for you and then you go there and then you find out that this is not what you wanted it's going to be a problem and it has happened before i've heard people talk about this that they applied for a certain course and then when they went to that particular university that course turned out to be pretty different than what they imagined so be careful about this stuff listen to your counselor so i really recommend hiring a counselor if you're applying to us or canada not so much for canada but for us at least it's pretty important because admissions are pretty unpredictable and if you get a good counselor he or she will be well connected so he or she will know what uh, what is going on with a particular university what kind of students they want but even then there there aren't that many good counselors in the market i i'm not saying there aren't any at all but you should have enough information to evaluate whether the counselor you're approaching is actually knowledgeable in what you want from them so this happened to me i i interviewed like two three counselors before set, settling on mine that's because the first counselor uh, i talked to he didn't know anything i actually knew better than him so uh, and this, i'm not flexing but like it was the truth he was he was giving misguided advice yeah ananya yeah so what happened with my counselor is um she helped me a lot with us but the thing is she wasn't going specifically with my course that is medical so as a medical student i'll be coming to that part she should have suggested me colleges in uk which she did not and the colleges that she suggested me in uk weren't up to the mark which mm. ended up in me getting some really bad colleges in uk but really great ones in us and it messed up so it's important that you get a really good counselor yeah so like i said uh there are certain counselors who are just in it for the money they don't really they're not really personal as long as you get into a college that you want they're good they don't care if if you're happy with it or not which is the red flag which is a major red flag because those counselors can misguide you another co- uh, counselor i talked to so my resume was not up to the mark it was like my grades and test scores were pretty medio- mediocre and he was like i wouldn't be able to get into any good college so i should probably try to apply to uh, lower tier colleges which was again i knew it was wrong because i've researched into this in enough- i had research into it enough at that point to know that there were people who had lower stats than me and got in and then finally when i talked to my th- but um she she was very very supportive and not not in a non genuine kind of way supportive it she was genuine about it she she recognized that my application needed more work my resume needed more work she guided me through uh, building my resume she helped me with my test scores as well and uh, at the same time she Uh, she helped me with my essays and i i think essays were my strongest point in the application which is why i got into uc berkeley at least that's what i believe right now um so it's very important to have a good counselor before going approaching counselors you have to do your own research into these things because they can seriously misguide you if all if all they want is money but there are good counselors in the market who are very genuine about this process and they will uh, really really help you build your application even if it's in the last minute like i have with my counselor in the in 12th grade and she helped me build, build my uh, application throughout the summer and my application looked 10 times better than it did before her so yeah in that case please be careful with uh, who you are interacting when it comes to this at least an important dates that you should make a note of like have an excel sheet or just have a written handout and keep it by your side all the time because when this application season starts things start to get really confusing there's a lot on your mind and you can easily forget things so it's better to make a note somewhere and constantly look at it so application and decision timelines application components selectivity you also want to know acceptance rates because acceptance rates can go down to percent which is very less so if you are thinking that i nobody thinks this because it's 
say Harvard or Stanford, no, nobody thinks that they'll have a guaranteed admission. But if you're thinking that you have good grades and you have like 1600 SAT score or something, uh, and you'll get ga uh, guaranteed admission into Harvard and Stanford, it doesn't work like that in US. It does not work on merit. So you have to keep selectivity in mind. If you're applying for financial aid, you have to keep those guidelines in mind. Uh, admission counselors. So another thing is that when you're working with admission counselors, you have to make sure that they also set personal deadlines in your uh, interactions. So when I was working with my counselor, she set deadlines for every application we were going to send out that I had to finish this particular application by this date and I had to finish all my essays by this date. This helps, this, this really helps a lot because in 12th you have a lot of exams and stuff and it's easy to like stress over exams and let go of this whole process. Um, but if you have someone who's setting deadlines for you, it's going to help a lot uh, to keep yourself concentrated on it. And one of the most important parts is managing stress and anxiety. I had a major burnout in 12th because of this. I applied to 22 universities, which is a very, very bad decision. You should not apply to that many universities. Even if, you're, if you want to apply to many universities, 15 is the limit beyond which you, I'm sure you're going to burn out. So um, limit you, how many universities you're going to apply to. It's very easy to like, panic that you're not going to get into any of the good universities and keep applying one after the other, which happened to me. But uh, as a rule, if you apply to 14 good universities, you're sure to get into at least one of them. Just, just by the sake of chance, you're not going to get into one of them. So limit how many uh, universities you're going to apply to. So for... Um, uh, just a second. Yeah, sorry for that. Um, all right, so for, uh, you, this is particularly for US, but even Canada has this. There's an early deadline and a late, uh, like regular deadline. So early deadline, you usually apply by December or November. For universities in the US, you apply by November. And for Canada, you apply by December. So what this early deadline does is you apply early and you get your decision early so that you have options early on rather than regular deadline. When you apply by regular deadline, you usually have uh, your decisions rolling in after boards or during boards. So that's completely up to you. You have to check uh, if all the early deadlines have passed, at least for US, whichever universities are doing early deadline, those, those deadlines have passed. They may still be open for Canada. So you should probably check into that. Uh, um, US has a different structure than Canada in terms of deadlines. So there's early decision, uh, which is like, you commit to a university well in advance. So you're applying there early and you're telling them, if you admit me, I will go to your university only. I will not go, in, go to any other university. It's a binding commitment. You cannot opt out of it. If you opt out of it, that's going to create a problem for you in terms of applying to other universities. So if you're, if you're sure that this is, my, this is my particular dream school and I really want to go there, which for me was NYU, by the way, uh, you can apply for early decision. So the outcome could be you either get admitted, then you shouldn't apply to any other university. Then your application process is over then and there. It, you can get uh, rejected. Uh, uh, so you can't apply to that university again during the regular deadline because it's already rejected you for that particular year. Um, you can get deferred, which is like you get deferred to the regular deadline. So your application gets carried out on to regular decision deadline. So now your uh, decision will come out, say, during boards or after boards. Um, or this is very specific to NYU. I don't know if other universities do this. You can get waitlisted. So essentially what a waitlist is, it's like you're admitted 
but they don't have enough seats for you yet. So uh, if you get waitlisted, technically you're admitted, but uh, you, you for you to get that seat, someone else would have to deny their seat. So uh, if you're waitlisted, it's not like you're rejected. You have the option to stay on the waitlist. And if someone leaves their seat, they will take you off the waitlist and you will get in. This is not decided by merit. It's pretty random. Uh, I can get into waitlist later if you guys get, get waitlisted. It's, very, it's a very complex process and it would take too much time to explain it, which is why I don't want to do it right now. There's also early action. In this case, you apply early, but it's not a binding commitment. It, so you can apply early, you can get your decision early, but it's not necess necessary for you to go to that university. You can also apply to other universities. And there's rolling admissions, which is some universities have that, which is basically like you can apply at any time and your uh, admission will come out at any time. So they might have a time period from September to say January or February, you can apply at any time. And within that time frame or after that, you can get your decisions. Um, application components. So application, which is basically your personal history, your demography, et cetera. This is uh, there for both US and Canada. You have to send your transcripts to both US and Canada. For US, they will take your 9th to 12th uh, grade marks. When I say 12th grade marks, they're going to take your mid terms. So uh, basically your term exam marks. So it's important that you do well on them. Even if you're not doing well, that's completely fine too, because they're judging other parts of your application, which can give you an advantage as well. I didn't do well on my term exams and I still got into a, into pretty good universities. So if, if you're in the process and you're slipping off during your term exams, it's fine. Don't panic. Um, for Canada, uh, they take, they concentrate mainly on your 10th marks, 11th marks, and 12th predicted and pre-boards. So it's important that you do well on in 12th pre-boards. Um, yeah, and for Canada, you also have to submit your roll number. In case of test scores, uh, USA requires SAT Act, which is basically, I will go into that later. Um, and TOEFL because TOEFL or IELTS because you're an international student, so you have to show them that you're fluent in English. Um, for this year, SAT and most universities are not taking SAT and ACT. You should check on the university's website. Then they still leave the option that you can submit your SAT score if you're very happy with it and you want it to be considered. But if you're not happy with your SAT score, it's better to leave it out. For Canada, they don't require SAT or ACT, but they do require TOEFL or IELTS for the sake of English fluency. Letters of recommendation are required in US. They may not, they, at least the universities I applied to in Canada, they didn't require uh, letters of recommendation, but University of British Columbia did require references. So uh, I submitted, one of them had to be the counselor's phone number and her name, and another one had to be one of your teachers. Some universities require resume separately. It's optional, but uh, it leaves a good impression if you submit one. They also want a list of activities, so your extracurricular activities. This is uh, especially true of US. This may or may not be the case in Canada. For example, U University of British Columbia requires your extracurricular activities, but University of Toronto may not. Essays, again, this is mandatory in US. They'll make you write, if you're applying to like five universities, they'll make you write 10 essays. So it's important to get started early on in the process. If you're in 12, I hope you've started. Uh, if you haven't, uh, it's good. You can still start. Uh, if you're in 11th or 10th, um, a good time to start would be the starting of your 12th, at least brainstorming because it takes a lot of time. As for Canada, certain universities require essays, certain, certain don't. So if your university doesn't require essays, it's fine. Uh, the application is like that, don't freak out. If it requires essays, it helps if you're applying to US as well because you can use your essays from US for Canada as well. 
I know UBC does require essays. University of Waterloo has an optional personal profile, which is mandatory for com competitive programs, but not for other programs. I didn't submit one. I still got in interviews. Uh, so in US, interviews are mostly optional. So you can decide if you want to give an interview or not. And even if you decide to give an interview, it's not necessary that you will get an interviewer because it, it's a completely different system. Interviews are not mandatory. It's just an ad addition to your application. So even if you don't get an interview, it's completely fine. It does not affect your application. Certain universities in Canada have mandatory you know, uh, interviews for very competitive programs. Uh, many don't. Demonstrated interest. So this is very important for US. So you have to demonstrate interest in a particular university. Uh, certain colleges give this by our college essay for their application where you can demonstrate your interests. Basically, they want to know that you really want to come there. And it's not just for their prestige, you want to use the resources as well. If a certain college does not have that why essay, you still have to try to demonstrate your interest through other essays to show that your goals align with the university's mission. Um, how to research for college and make college list. So I'm going to walk you through this process um, because a lot of people don't know how to go about this. Even I didn't know for a very long time, but I'm going to show you how to do that. So first you start with rankings. There's hundreds of rankings out there for uh, universities. Uh, so the ones that I trust that that are actually reliable according to me are QS rankings. So you have to sub, uh, search rankings by subject because one university might be good in a particular subject and may not be that good in another subject. So QS rankings is one of the universities that I trust. I'm searching for psychology because I've been through this so I can confirm. So this is 2020 QS rankings. So you can see uh, universities coming up here and another you know uh, another ranking that I trust this is for overall these are world rankings so another university I oh, sorry another ranking that I trust is times so you can see universities coming here and if you search individually the colleges on uh, on these rankings, they give you a profile like objective uh, statistics, so they can show you what ranking this particular university has, how its ranking has been for the uh, past year. So here is going down. They show you the ranking criteria, which is a very important thing. You should see the ranking criteria for each ranking because different uh, rankings have different rank ranking criteria, and accordingly, their rankings also vary. So over, over here, you have times ranking criteria, and you can see the numbers vary between times and QS. So basically, this is because uh, times tends to focus on research more. So if you're going for research, you might want to <clears throat> look into times more and QS uh, focuses more on employability. So if you're going for a, a field which is more job oriented, you might want to look into QS more. <coughs> and then, um, um, so certain countries have their own rankings which show the prestige of a particular uh, university within that country. Uh, so US has US News, which is, pretty good pre predictor of that university's ranking within that country. So you can see the rankings here. Most of them tend to align, but not necessarily. So say University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign comes up here in top 10, but may not come up here in US in top 10. It might be in top 30, but that's because that's a world university ranking for, um, Canada, this would be like uh, a trustworthy ranking would be Maclean's, I think. I relied on Maclean's personally. 
and always always make sure that you are searching for rankings by the subject you are applying for so ubc is the first toronto is second mcgill is third so that's that's how you get started on the process and then you go to individual universities website so i'm going to berkeley because i can navigate it easily so first if you want to see admissions requirement you go to the ad admissions requirement you go under uh, undergraduate and they give you the requirement they also give you tuition fees one thing that you should check well in it advances what tuition fees a particular university has before applying so that you don't have any surprises later you you can also check for financial aid if it's in, in available for international students or not they will explicitly state whether financial aid is available for students or not so financial aid is basically uh, a grant type thing so they will fund you to come and study there it might be a loan or it might be a gift aid that depends on the university uh, the next most important thing that you ch you should check is the course itself so i'm going to check psychology again because i know how to navigate it so if i go on this website i i get to the uh, university psychology department website so i can look for research here so i can see the kind of research that's there i can click on individual research and see what people are researching in then i go to undergraduate i get an academic overview i can see what what how the course structure is so this is what they concentrate on within the field of psychology um i can also see individual courses so i can go to major requirements and see the kind of courses that are offered so these are prerequisites so if i click here i will get a set of co courses if i click here i will get a set of courses and this is a second yeah this course information here so um yeah so i go to this website i get a set of courses here so i can see course names emotional intelligence stress and coping person and big big data so this is what i'm talking about different universities tend to offer different courses within the same field so um of the uh courses that i felt were unique to uh the psychology department and berkeley were um so global mental health was one of the uh courses that were uh, unique to this department human nature was another course that was unique to this department um design thinking human emotion human happiness this is pretty famous it's also available on edx if you want to get a feel of how professors in berkeley teach you can definitely search up this course on edx and take it for free uh psychology of creativity this was one of the deal makers for me for psychology because i always wanted to combine my interest in literature and english uh with psychology and this was pretty unique to this department so now i'm going to show the course structure in university of toronto it's the same process you navigate the website you go to um okay wait i'll search specific keywords because i don't want to spend too much time so i am on the department of psychology website i can see the research i can see undergraduate so program requirements here i get the program requirements major program so they will put out the course structure for you then you can you can see the kind of courses that are there within that particular program and certain universities tend to have different uh, programs within the same major so there's a specialist program there's a research specialist program which i think will be more research oriented environment and behavior program so seeing course structures is very very important because like i said again that a university might offer particular courses in uh, one major and another university might be offering different courses 
Um, so let's go back to this. Yeah, evaluate your opportunities. You can find research and even internships on your university website. Campus life, you can find, uh, there's a separate tab for campus life. You can see what kind of extracurricular opportunities are there. Uh, student reviews, okay, this is another important one. One of the websites that I trust for student reviews is Niche. I find that there are less extreme views about universities on niche. It's basically a ranking system. I don't particularly trust the ranking, but just a second. But I trust the reviews because the reviews are given by students within the institution. And it's not like students are being paid to give those reviews. They come and give, give it on their own. You can see that because there's so many reviews. So they, they have a whole report card. So say academics A plus, uh, diversity A plus, et cetera, DOMS B plus, which I can attest to. DOMS are pretty small at Berkeley. Um, campus food B minus. I've heard some horror stories from my friend, safety C minus. Again, a true fact. So from my own experience, you can see that this is a reliable website for reviews. So, yeah, so they have po po polls as well. So 70% of students agree that professors put out a lot of effort into teaching their classes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you can also get a general idea of the environment. So these many people think it's competitive and hardworking. These many people think motivated and driven, et cetera. Um, and here are the reviews. So this is one website that I recommend that you check out if you want to get an idea of how a particular university is besides spending your time watching YouTube like I did in 11th, uh, which is very time consuming and not the best idea. Uh, so student reviews and aim for the best in your field. Generally, you, you want to aim for top 30 and to be on the safe side, you want to be in the top 50 range just so that you get into a, a good college. Um, otherwise, I personally don't think it's it's worth the money. Finances, check tuition rates in advance. Um, uh, check for entrance scholarships. So certain universities tend to have entrance scholarships. I know that um, University of Toronto has, uh, has one, which is Lester B. Pearson. It's pretty competitive, but if you win it, you basically get to go to University of for free. So University of Toronto entrance scholarships. So you have these certain entrance scholarships listed out. And if you're an international student, then you want to Specify your international because most of the scholarships are meant for domestic students. So you get a separate website. Um, you have they will give you a database and you can search for it. Uh, universities also tend to have uh, in department scholarships. So you see Berkeley in department scholarships which you can avail after you're in university. So it's not like you don't have chances at getting financial aid after getting into university, you can. Um, another thing to look into, so they're clearly mentioning that they're not eligible, international students are not eligible for financial aid, but there are scholarships. I, I don't want to spend time, but I, there are separate websites within the university website for scholarships. Another thing that you want to look into is external scholarship databases. Basically, these are scholarships uh, offered by um, private organizations. 
for certain programs or certain um, say women in STEM program or psychology program and it's available. Uh, most, of, uh, most of these scholarships are for international students who are going abroad. So it's all a matter of research. Other ways to earn in university is if you're going for a uh, university that has co-ops. So co-ops are basically like you work for uh, one semester or one term within your university and for other two terms you study. And when you're working, you're work working within the field which you're uh, studying in. So you get uh, paid while studying your, uh, and this, these ex uh, whatever you're earning can be applied to your tuition fee or your personal ex uh, uh, expenses. Internships is another way to earn. Part-time jobs are also an option. So you can opt for tutoring within your university. Being an RA, and that means being an, uh, a resident assistant. So basically what you do is you live in dorms and you're, uh, you're supposed to manage your floor. You're supposed to resolve conflicts and take care of people. Uh, people can approach you if they need something for, from you. So that's another way to earn money. So it's not like uh, in case of finances, US and Canada are completely barren. There are still chances. Tests that are required, especially the ones I gave, SAT was one. So it's, it has a reading comprehension section, which for me was a little bit difficult. Uh, I, a lot of people find it difficult because it tends to be tricky. So it, uh, as soon as you can get started on the SAT, the better. At least for this year, SAT and ACT are waived for many people, including international students. So if you're applying this year, you're very lucky. Uh, it has a grammar section. Um, despite the fact, like for me, it was like, yeah, I know English grammar. And then I went in to give my first SAT and the score was disastrous. There are certain things in grammar that are not obvious to the eye. So obviously opt for some kind of book even for preparing for gr the grammar section or some kind of coaching or even Khan Academy works. If you're like well above 1500, you can just practice from Khan Academy, it's free. Uh, there's a math section, there's two math sections. One is calcul calculator, one is no calculator. Uh, these tend to be your basic algebra problems. Uh, even if you haven't taken math in 11th, 12th, it's completely fine. Uh, you can just buy a book and uh, certain books are very uh, detailed in different concepts in math. So they can help you out. And there's an anal analytical writing section. It is not required by all the universities, but many top universities require it. So before giving it, I recommend that you check out from specific universities' websites whether they require these, uh, this section. ACT has a similar format, but it's just a bit easier in terms of the content, but the timings are horrible. Like at least for me, the time pressure was too much and I can't cope with a lot of time pressure. I need a go good amount of time. So if you're like me, who's not a good test taker under in under pressure conditions, you're better off taking the SAT. It's all a matter of practicing strategies for both these tests. The content isn't that bad, Everything is about strategies. So the, the more you can hone your strategies in approaching these tests, the better. The often is pretty straightforward. It has a reading comprehension section, listening section, speaking section, writing section. Um, just a few weeks of practice is enough. If you're fluent in English, um, it's, it's the one test that you will breeze through in the process. I personally gave TOEFL when I was sick and I could not speak properly and I still scored pretty well on the speaking section. So um, get a book for each of these uh, tests, do a practice test, see where you stand and accordingly decide how you're going to prepare. If you're well above 1400, 1500, just prepare on your own. If you're below say 1300 or in the 1300 range, you might need some more practice. So either you can opt for more detailed books or Khan Academy, or you can buy packages online as well. Prep Scholar is pretty good. Magush is 
also said to be very good. It's completely up to you. So one of the things that are very important uh, in the US application is extracurriculars and essays. If your Canadian application has this component, it is going to be very important too. So what the, this component does, it helps you set apart from other ca candidates. You have to be authentic, like I said, and you have to keep investing in your personal interests. So anything starting from knitting can be uh, counted as an extracurricular on your application as, as long as you're spending substantial time on it. Um, for essays, they tend, this tends to be a little confusing and stressful part of the application because basically the universities are going to figure out your personality from the essays. So you want to present yourself very well, but you also don't want to be uh, inauthentic. So, the, uh, so there's a certain general essay formula to go about when you're writing your essay. So I've listed it out. Uh, so this general essay formula is you should tell your experience the, your yeah. impact within that experience and the impact that particular experience had on you. That's pretty important. Um, and different prompts tend to have, uh, deviate from this formula in particular ways. I can help you out with that personally. Uh, if you just approach me, I, I had I went through this process. I'm helping certain people with this process right now as well. So um, say the Y College essay will dif differ from say your common app essay or your activity, list out your app activity essay. So this is just something to consider. And another important thing to consider when you're applying to US is OPT. So OPT is basically getting a work permit for a certain period after you graduate so that you can stay within the country and work. So non-STEM OPT is 12 months. STEM OPT, if you're, if you're taking a STEM subject, it's 24 months. After this time period gets over, either you should have your employer sponsor you for a work visa or you have to go back to your country. For Canada, uh, this post graduate uh, graduation work permit varies from eight months to three years. Again, the same story after it gets over, you have to have an employer uh, advocate for you. If you're going for medicine in either of these countries, I really, really, really suggest having a backup career because um, Medicine is pretty unpredictable within these universe, uh, sorry, these countries. Uh, Sria will get more into that, but from I researched into this before when I was in 10th, and it was like, uh, you have to do bachelor's and then give MCAT, which by the way is for seven hours. So I, I personally think if I was applying for medicine, I would be better off giving NEET or UK CAT or going to UK. And, uh, even then, the, you have to write your own set of essays and then have your own resume, these particular extracurriculars and volunteer hours and stuff, which is pretty heavy to do in college. So, uh, I, and on top of that, many universities state on their website that they can't guarantee admissions to international students. They don't give admissions to international students. The ones that do mention that they do, but Recently, we had a workshop in which we were told that even for med medicine, even if universities state that they give admissions to international students, it often happens that they don't end up admitting any international student. Plus, you have to uh, show proof of your funding way in advance to show that you can stay there and fund your own education. You won't get, I don't think you get aid. That's why they ask for proof of funding. That's why even if you clear the interview, that's where a lot of international students might fail. So if you're going to US or Canada for medicine, they're very similar in that sense. Please have a backup option in case it does not work out. Um, understanding what universities are selecting. So they're seeing academic strength, rigor of the courses you're taking SAT at. They look at uh, gender balance within the cluster, uh, selecting job difficult balance. There's a lot of things that they check. I can personally send you these slides. This would be a lot to go over. Berkeley, which is very confusing for 
my parents and I, but it happens that if you're overqualified for a certain university, they will not take you in because they know that you will not come over there. So have say, many safe options as well. Evaluations are both objective in the sense your scores and stuff and subjective in the sense your extra, extra curriculars. They do contextual evaluations. So if you're going in from Bahrain, they will see the kind of op opportunities you have in Bahrain and how much of those opportunities you've used and accordingly they will decide if they want to admit you or not. Advantages of studying in US and Canada, flexibility. So this was one of the major reasons why I wanted to go to US and or Canada and nowhere else. So basically, um, like I said, right now, I'm intending to major in psychology and English. I have the kind of flexibility that I can do two things at the same time. And at the same time, I can also minor in creative writing if I want to, if I decide to later in the future. Um, I know people who take business courses, uh, computer science courses at the same time. My first semester looked like me taking an astronomy course, sociology course, comparative literature course. And when I told my friends about this, they were so weirded out. They were like, how, how does this align with any of your goals? But that's the beauty of it. Uh, you can follow your goals as well, but you also have the space to expand your knowledge, which I think was a very big plus for me because I had interests in so many different fields. You can research with and uh, are taught by people at the top of their fields. So this was also a major plus for me, especially while deciding to go to Berkeley. Um, so a lot of the professors here tend to be uh, if you're going to universities like Harvard, Stanford, et cetera, and UC Berkeley, you will encounter at least one professor who is a press winner, which is a very big thing. You can also research with some, some of these professors. Um, you are being taught by these professors. And one of the biggest advantages of this is these professors are so passionate about this uh, subject that is contagious. You begin to love their subject as well. And that's something I definitely uh, faced in my first semester. My professors were very passionate about the subject and I started loving these subjects as well. Uh, you also have a multicultural environment. Uh, so you meet many different kinds of people from different places. So again, that's a learning experience in itself. You have the option to study abroad as well. So. Uh, say you're studying in US for one semester, you can go and study in Europe. You can go back to India and study in a university. You can go and study in New Zealand, wherever you want. That depends on the options your university is offering. Many universities have entrepreneurship and innovative culture. Berkeley and Stanford definitely have one because of their proximity to uh, Silicon Valley. So if you are looking to go into entrepreneurship, US is definitely a place to consider. And like I showed you, we have, uh, they offer very unique courses. Right now I came across this course while enrolling, which was on Anime, uh, sorry, that, that's the wrong word, Anime. And I showed it to my friend and he was like, pretty excited about it. So that's definitely something to look into. And now Sriya will, yeah hello okay uh, so hi guys i'm going to introduce myself again um i'm sriya and i am currently waiting for my college to be out i'm done with the counseling process in india and well yeah i got in uc berkeley too but i left that because i'm going to come to the reasons now the first topic we're going to touch upon in my presentation uh, will be medicine and veterinary sciences so yeah, Ananya, can you put the slide? Can you see it? Yeah, yeah I can see it. Just put it on the second slide. I mean, uh, slide show me. This one? Oh, wait, or... I'll screen share instead. All right. Yeah. 
Okay, wait. I'll just screen share. Okay. Yeah, can you listen to me, all of you? I feel there's a connectivity error somewhere. Yeah, we can. Hear. Yeah, fine. Yeah, okay, fine. Uh, medicine and veterinary sciences. Well, the best countries you can think of are India, USA, UK, Canada, and other European nations because Europe is known for its medical field. Now let's come to the advantages and disadvantages. Since most of the time is gone, I'm gonna just rush through all of this, but I've made the points clear. Well, in India, the advantage is it's, you're gonna get done with undergraduation, that is MBBS in 5.5 years, out of which one year will be your internship. There is a great amount of exposure because you deal with actual patients and you know the kind of uh, diseases which are already spreading in India, right? And the third most important thing, obviously, it's less expensive as compared to the other countries, and it has great teaching too. Now, when we come up to the disadvantages, I know many people who want to do research but aren't able to do so because they study in India, and I am one of them. So it's hard for you to look for undergraduate research opportunities. Second thing is the entrance exam. NEAT is heavy competition. You have to really dedicate a lot of time and efforts to crack that exam. And I've seen people taking drops and drops. And well, you have to be really serious about that exam for in order for you to crack it. And third thing is NEAT PG. So once you're done with MBBS, your struggle doesn't end there. For you to settle in India, it's a greater struggle after MBBS. You have to write NEAT PG, then you have to write the DNB exams, PG exams which is all kind of, I mean, it's a huge task. Let's come to USA and Canada. Now, well, USA and Canada, the thing is, it is very advantageous in terms of research and teaching and less competition, but the problem arises in timing and the cost for it. Well, in US and Canada, the system for medicine is that you do four years of pre-med and then you write an exam called MCAT. After writing MCAT, you have four years of med school. And after med school, you have to write the US MLE exam again to go into post-graduation. So there are exams and exams and exams. And I personally felt that's a waste of time. So it's at least going to take you minimum nine years to complete MBBS, which took 5.5 years in India. So you know the difference now. And since it takes nine years, plus US is already expensive, it adds to your cost. So the main reason for me not going to US is because number one, I wanted to study in India. That's a different thing. Second thing is that it's gonna take a lot of time, which is just time waste. Instead, doing MBBS in India or in other countries, and then moving to US for your post-graduation, if you want to research, is a better option. Now, UK and other European countries, in my opinion, are one of the best ones for you to pursue medicine. It is because, number one, it's an internationally recognized degree. So no matter which country you go to, if you have a European degree, an MBBS degree from Europe, it is recognized everywhere. So you wouldn't have to repeat any course or something like that. Second thing, the timing is almost like India's. Teaching is great. And there is decent research as compared to India, lesser than US, but you do have research there. Disadvantages is, is a bit expensive as compared to India. And there is an extra entrance exam that you need to crack in order to get into UK Medical College. Either it is the UCAT, UK CAT exam or the BMAT exam. So UK CAT and BMAT are pretty easy. The thing is you have to dedicate a lot of time to practice them. The problem with me was I was informed of these exams really late. And because of that, I missed deadlines and, you know, there was a lot of hustle. So yeah, UK and the other countries are out of your hand here. Now let's come to UK admissions. Uh, one thing you have to know is it's not as complex as the ones in US. Ananya already covered about everything that you need to do in order to, you know, uh, select a college in US. The similar thing is what you have to do here, but the difference between US and UK is in US, while you're doing your undergraduation, 
you can decide your major, right? But in UK, you have to be sure of what you're going to do even before you apply. So you have to keep in mind which course you're applying to. So the first thing you have to do for applying to UK universities is knowing which course. Second thing is the portal through which you apply to these universities, which is known as the UCAS portal. So in this portal, you're allowed to select maximum of five universities. So for this, it's very important that you do your university research very well, keeping in mind your scores, your BMAT, UCAT scores, or the other entrance scores, your uh, transcript scores, or your uh, school scores, which you've been getting since ninth grade. So keeping all of those in mind, select five universities, one of which can be your dream university, one of it can be your safety universities, and the ones in between can be fine. The thing with UK colleges is that almost all of them are good in terms of teaching. And this is specific to medicine. I'm not really sure about the other courses, but you can be confident about any college you're getting in UK. So now the requirements for these colleges are obviously your uh, ninth to 12th grade transcripts, that is your scorecards and report cards, IELTS scores. So IELTS is very important for UK. That's because they need to know that you are able to comprehend and speak English. So you need to have a good IELTS score, preferably a band of 7.5 and above, okay? And obviously you need to have a passport because the visa application process for UK is pretty complex. Uh, adding to that, you also need to have a funding proof that your parents are able to fund your education in UK. Apart from that, obviously the specific exam scores. So look at what your uh, course is. See if you need another, if you need to write any other exam for it. I only looked at medicine, so I know about these two exams, but there are other courses which might require an extra exam. So you have to be sure about your course and the exams required and finish the exams with the scores right before the deadline because deadlines are very important. I missed uh, my BMAT exam last year in 2019 because I couldn't register for it by the time the deadlines were over. And after that, for UK, all you need is a personal statement. Unlike US, you don't have to write essays and essays for different colleges. In UK, you just need one personal statement. So this one personal statement should be covering everything about you, your passion for the subject, your passion for the course. Okay, so it's not college specific. Personal statement is something you write about why you want to do this course, what interests you in it. It doesn't necessarily have to be uh, you talking about your entire passion for the course, but all you have to make sure is your personality is reflected upon in your personal statement. And apart from that, recommendation letters, obviously, you need at least two to three recommendation letters from your teachers. So it's very important that you tell your teachers beforehand that I need a recommendation letter so that they're prepared to. So mostly try informing your teachers that you need a recommendation letter by September-ish, so they are prepared with their uh, recommendation letters for you. And now internship and portfolios. Now uh, in UK, if you have to study medicine, there is, it's not compulsory, but they usually prefer candidates who have done internship or shadowing, uh, you know, internships and shadowing at, at some hospital with some doctor. Similarly, if you're going for an art course or some course which requires for you to show your portfolios, it's important that you make up your own portfolio apart from your resume. So in UK, you're also required to submit your resume which is most of the times they ask for a one page resume, which just has all your scores and your achievements from ninth to 12th. So making a resume is easy. If you go online, you can definitely find one page re resume formats and just fill it through. Now, the things that are important for UK is the deadlines, because once you miss the deadlines, it becomes difficult. So for the top universities in UK, that is Oxford and Cambridge, the deadlines are somewhere in October. And even for courses such as uh, medicine and dentistry and those uh, 
free medical areas. The deadlines usually end in October. And you can see the other deadlines here, 15 January of next year is the deadline for most of the courses. And some courses of art and designs have their deadlines for application submission in March. And 30th June is like something like the final call at the airport. So after 30th June, if you submit any application, it will definitely be rejected. So application process is through UCAS, that is universities and college admission service. So this UCAS website, uh, the reason I haven't specified much about it is because it's very easy to navigate. So once you get to the UCAS website, you just register yourself and it takes you through the process. It gives you your deadlines. It tells you what exactly to fill. So it's pretty easy to go through the admission process once you register with UCAS. So UK admissions is very easy. Let me sum up on the stuff you need again. You need recommendation letters. You need IELTS scores. SAT scores aren't compulsory, but it's great if you have them. You need uh, your personal statement. You need 11th, uh, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th transcripts and the required exam, specific exams for specific courses. And finally, you will also, uh, wait, what were the points? Yeah, funding proof is what you need. So that is it for UK. Please let me know if you have any specific doubts for UK. Let's come to Singapore. Now, unlike UK and US, Singapore is completely cut off from your extracurriculars. It completely focuses on your merit. So since we're all CBSE students, and I know most of the people who are gonna be watching these are CBSE students, uh, as an Indian student, you will be required to have exceptionally good scores in board exams, 12th grade board exams with five subjects, including English. And you also need really good SAT or ACT scores. And English proficiency test that is IELTS is not compulsory for all courses, but the university that I had applied to in Singapore, NUS, it asked me for a compulsory IELTS score too. So make sure that it's, it's mostly university specific. So when you're applying to Singapore, you go to the particular university website and you go for applications. So it is specific for each universities and you also see the application requirements. So if you want to go to this university, look at the requirements and see if you have all of those because it varies from each university. So yeah, <clears throat> let's finally come to India. Uh, India, I know majority of people are looking for medicine or engineering, which is usually what people think, but I'll be covering other topics too. So when we come to medicine or engineering in India, it's very simple because you just need one entrance exam to get into that particular college. So when we talk about medicine, there is only need. There isn't any other exam that you need to write for getting into medical colleges in India. So you write need, you go through counseling and you get the college. But for engineering, you have different exams, different state exams. The main exam being JE mains. Apart from that, you have BITSAT for BITS. And so basically for engineering, depending on what kind of college you want and what and the level of your preparation, you can look for different uh, colleges. Apart from that, there is also DASA quota, which has been scraped out this year. So I'm not pretty sure if you still have it in for uh, the Gulf students. But if you are aiming for engineering colleges, then it's important that you look if there are other quotas other than the main entrance exams in order for you to get into those particular colleges, especially considering uh, all of you are NRI students. So for engineering, you need to clear these exams. But for private colleges, uh, the admission is relatively easier. That is because private colleges don't really take high scoring students. So if you feel your scores in these entrance exams are low, and if you're able to afford these private colleges, then you have to go to the specific university website and you're supposed to apply from there. And private colleges are pretty much a guaranteed admission. So yeah, that is it about medicine and engineering. All you have to do is write the entrance exams. It's a big headache, but that's how uh, admission happens in India. Now let's come to design and art or architecture courses. So for design courses, there are different exams, which I've mentioned on the screen here. 
the most famous one being the exam for NIFT, that is the National Institute of Fashion Technology. So for uh, all these exams, what happens is your score is taken, you're shortlisted and subsequent rounds are taken. I mean, each college takes the subsequent rounds of interview and discussion after your shortlist comes. So if you score well in these exams, you're shortlisted by the university. Then they call you for interviews or discussion or whatever their mode of selection is after shortlisting. And then you're selected to that particular college. But again here, application, the college is individual as it was for the private universities in medical and engineering. That means you're supposed to go to the particular college website and apply through that website. So that is for design courses. Let's come to art. So for art courses, uh, the minimum requirement obviously is for you to pass your 12th grade with a minimum aggregate of 50%. And apart from that, there is a priority given to humanity stream by many art colleges in India. And obviously because it's a art course, they will require the, there was someone entering. Okay, that's a chat. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, apart from that, you will be also required to submit a particular portfolio depending on the university. Again, this is university specific. So all the design, art and architecture courses that I've talked about here are university specific. Let's come to architecture. So architecture, the most famous exam in India is NATA. Apart from that, there is the AAT test, which is for admission for into IITs. So if you want to do an architecture course in the IITs, you have to write the AAT exam. But the nationally accepted exam for various architectural colleges is NATA. So it's a pretty easy exam. I've seen the course of it. You'll, you're supposed to compulsorily have mathematics in 12th grade for you to clear those exams. So for architecture, uh, the basic requirements are the entrance exam, either the state level exams or in the university specific exams. So you have to research upon which university you want to go and which exam it accepts and, you know, uh, prepare for it according to whichever university you want to go to. And again, the counseling is done based on merit. And honestly, I'm going to explain what counseling is to you guys because Last year, until last year, I did not know what counseling was. So counseling is basically you submit your scorecard and your details into this one website. Since it's Corona time, most of the counseling is happening online. And it basically filters off based on your scores. You give your uh, university preferences and it allots you a seat into the university. And you take that seat allotment and you go to the university and get your admission. So that is basically what counseling is. It's completely based on your scores. So uh, I've also had some friends who are preferring to do law courses. So for law, there is one national exam for admission to the national colleges for law. That is the CLAT exam. It's conducted by the consortium. So for that, you have to register for yourself and prepare for CLAT and write the exam and counseling is done for those national colleges later. But there are some private colleges, the most famous one being Symbiosis, which have their own exams. So you write those exams and clear it and get your admission into different law courses. So basically for India, all you need is to know where you want to go to know which college you want to apply to because most courses are university specific except for medical courses. So you're supposed to clear 12. Also look at the, the stream requirements for each course because as you saw in architecture, it's important that you have math. Similarly, for medicine courses, it's important that you have bio in 11th and 12th. So that's all you have to look at and look at the entrance exam, register yourself for the entrance exam, prepare for the exams, write the exams, undergo counseling and get your college. The stuff in India is pretty simple as compared to uh, US, UK, et cetera. So that is it about India. And I'm also going to uh, show you guys one second. Uh, I'll just screen share again. So since Ananya showed you how to navigate through uh, selecting universities in US, I'll just show you guys how to do that for Indian universities. All right. Uh, 
Okay. So the most important ranking in Indian universities is the NIRF ranking. So I'm just going to go to NIRF ranking 2020. Okay, it's taking time. Well, yeah. Uh, personally, this is how I have uh, decided my medical college. So when you go to the NIRF ranking network here, you have the different parameters here and the different courses too. Let me just get to that. So this is the NIRF ranking, which is based on different parameters, which will help you decide on which course is good and which college is good. So since I'm doing medical, let me just show you what medical and IRF rankings are for 2020. So as you can see here, you get this entire list of about, I think, 40 colleges in this first page. So these are the top 40 colleges according to the NIRF ranking for the year 2020. Now, when you go for more details, you get this. Now, this uh, the full forms for this are different, but I'll just tell you what they mean. This is the teaching. So you can see that AIMS, which is the best one in India, the best medical college, its teaching ranking is about 92. And this one is for research. This is the graduate outcome. And this is the peers or the group of people there, the crowd there, basically. And yeah, that is it about the NIRF ranking. So you can look through. Uh, apart from NIRF ranking for India, what is important is that you know the cutoffs. Since most of the admissions in India are through entrance exams, so it's important that you know the rank cutoffs of these different colleges. For example, AIMS, suppose you belong to the general category, also adding to reservations in India. You belong to general category. There are only 60 seats reserved in AIMS. And since it's the top university, the top 100 ranks have a greater chance of getting into AIMS. So in your counseling, Accordingly, you fill in AIMS as your top priority if you're ranked below 100 and you belong to general category, right? Now, when we talk about other universities, like this is the university I'll be applying to, Kasturba Medical College in Manipal. Well, this university is ranked ninth, but you can see that its research outcome is more than that of Jawaharlal Institute, that is JIPMIT. So depending on which factor you prefer. Like personally, I prefer research over teaching. So I would go for Kasturba Medical College before Jawaharlal Nehru. So similarly, other than medicine, you can go for other courses, engineering, et cetera, and look at all these rankings, look at the different parameters and decide which college you wanna to go to. After doing that, just go to individual college websites and see their cutoff ranks. Um, Kasturba Medical College cutoff rank is about 2000, I mean, sorry, 20,000, and my rank has been 6,000. So I have a clear chance of getting into this university. So I obviously put it as my first option. So that is how counseling works. And that is how you're supposed to uh, check the rankings and etc. of Indian colleges. NIRF ranking, according to me, is the most trustworthy one. So apart from the other rankings that I've looked at. And you can't really go for QS world ranking when it comes to Indian universities because uh, Indian universities mostly focus on academics and we all know that. So, well, yeah, that was my part. I am done with UK universities and Indian universities and Singapore. So yes, ask your questions. Let me see that it's some questions in the chat too. Application deadline, okay. Uh, Yugmita, I'll be posting this recording on my YouTube channel, so you can definitely go and check it out there, okay? You can stop recording at this point. Yeah, yeah, I'll just, yeah.